Bueno, señoras y señores, buenas tardes. It is a great pleasure for us to be able to present you tonight uh, the book uh, The Islamist uh, Phoenix uh, by Loretta Napoleone. Also with us this evening, together with the author of the book, we have uh, Javier Zaragoza, who is the chief prosecutor here at the National Court in Spain, the Alianza Nacional, and Manuel Gómez Acebo, who is the director general for Maghreb, Africa, Mediterranean, and the Middle East uh, in the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation. Our idea at this event is to make sure that we have a dynamic interaction between the panel and yourselves so that the book, Loretta's book, uh, sparks off discussion and debate uh, in which you can participate from the audience uh, as well as the panelists. I want to keep my comments short to start off with. The first thing, though, I'd like to say is that if you do as I have done, uh, that is uh, to say you actually um, look into the Amazon uh, book website uh, and uh, do a search uh, for Middle Eastern books. The very first one that will come up in your search will be the Islamist, uh, the Islamist uh, Phoenix. Uh, in other words, this is a key book that has been published, and it's, so it's not just an honor for us, but a great privilege for us to be able to welcome Loretta Napoleoni to this event. As Casa Arabe, as an institution, we have been running a whole series of activities for the purpose of uh, highlighting the phenomenon of uh, jihadism as it is known today, uh, but not only from the academic perspective. We have collaborated together with uh, the Chief Prosecutor uh, Javier Zaragoza on the subject. Uh, one of those events was held in, in the Casa Arabe in Cordoba, and we've also been working together with the Spanish Foreign Ministry on matters relating to this same subject. In, we will be holding an event when, when Santa Sanchez, uh, who was the previous um, director of the museum in Cordoba, will be talking to us about uh, the destruction on some of these cultural heritage items, uh, which uh, is uh, the context uh, for this event today. And that is a, a similar event we'll be holding here in Madrid. Uh, so without further ado, let me give the floor to Javier Zaragoza, who will be presenting the author, Loretta Napoleona. You have the floor, Javier. Good evening to you all. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And thank you to you, Loretta, <coughs> for giving me this opportunity to be part of the uh, presentation of your book and to do it here in Madrid. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be able to present uh, your book, speak, first of all, because you are a friend of mine, and secondly, because it really is worth reading your books because you are a scholar, an expert on the subject. Uh, Loretta, I'm sure, is someone everybody here in the audience knows. She's an, a top journalist who has worked with key media, press, such as La Stampa, La Repubblica, as well as El País in Spain. She's also an economist, and that perhaps explains why one of her books that she wrote, the purpose of that book was to explain issues relating to financing terrorism, organized crime, and she's also a political scientist. She's the author of a whole list of books. Uh, one has even been a bestseller uh, in the world today, Rogue Economics uh, as well. She's also written many of the works trying to analyze the phenomenon of terrorism from different perspectives. She's talked about terrorism financing terror in the past, and now she has written a book about the Islamic State, ISIS, which is perhaps the greatest concern that we have today for all of us who are working on the subject in other institutions. I myself, of course, am a prosecutor by profession. I'm the chief prosecutor at the National Court in Spain, so I'm the person responsible for the work done by our prosecutors in Spain trying to fight terrorism, especially jihadist terrorism. The Islamist phoenix is actually the sequel to, or the continuation of, or culmination to a series of other books analyzing 
The same. Terrorism. Loretta is an expert on this subject. I'm not going to explain what's in the book to you because you have to go out there and buy the book and read it if, if you really want to find out a lot more about the subject. Nor I'm going to explain how we investigate the Islamist uh, command cells or how we try to protect our society against um, terrorist acts and possible terrorism. I should not, of course, uh, speak in public about uh, these subjects. Uh, it's something that has to remain within the bounds uh, of uh, the national court uh, and within the bounds of the uh, security forces and the police forces trying to combat this form of terrorism. But what I can tell you is that the Islamist Phoenix is the tale of the story of the origin and development and current status of something that we could call, and I, without being afraid of making a, a, a mistake about this, we could call the new face of terrorism, completely different from the terrorism that we've been familiar with up until now. Nor really is it related to the Al-Qaeda jihadist terrorism that we've been familiar with just recently. It's completely different. It's, it's not the same terrorism that we even knew here in Spain uh, that took the face of ETA. It's, the, it's ISIS. Uh, it uh, was ISIL before the Islamic State uh, of Iraq and uh, Levant or, or Al-Qaeda in Iraq. It's had many different names. And if you read the book, you will see that all of these names uh, are milestones on the the road that has been taken by this new terrorist phenomenon, which is much more than just a single terrorist organization. It is a veritable state. It is a state that is trying to impose Islamic law, Sharia, in the territories that it is occupying. And furthermore, it has a strategy which is different from the strategy that we have seen Al-Qaeda using in the past. Uh, Al-Qaeda has always uh, uh, really perpetrated uh, violent attacks uh, in Western states uh, using its uh, command units through people highly trained jihadist. Uh, people who have really been well trained uh, and are using the social media and the internet. The use of the internet and social media is very important in understanding the expansion of radical jihadism. The Islamic State today, ISIS, of course, uh, has its own strategy. It's occupying territory in Syria and Iraq, that's what it's doing. It designs uh, and draws up uh, power structures to be able to dominate and control those territories. It, it's trying to create a social fabric, too. It tries to deal with the needs of all of the people living in the territories. Its army is also being formed by combatants from other countries uh, to such a extent that the calculation is, the estimate is, and, and these are figures uh, that uh, the, uh, the law and security forces uh, are using. More than 5,000 people apparently have traveled from Europe to the Syrian and Iraqi territories of ISIS to join the ranks of the army forming part of ISIS. So ISIS uh, has really made its mark uh, in the radical corners of uh, fundamentalism. And in these territories, uh, they are really taking full advantage of all of the financial resources and the uh, energy resources that exist to be able to fund the construction of a new state that will re redefine the boundaries and the borders uh, of the Middle East uh, defined uh, following on from the two world wars uh, and the colonial powers. Uh, and this will create a new form of nationalism. And Loretta says this in her book, a exclusive radical nationalism. There will only be one form of law, which will be Sharia. The, is the Islamic State is not just attacking Christians. It's, it's attacking Westerners, too. And very ferociously and violently, it's also attacking other sec factions uh, of um, uh, Islam the Shias, 
I think that shows you that these are very different strategies, and I think uh, in the mid and long term, the ISIS strategy is much more dangerous than any other terrorist uh, organization's uh, strategy. If you look at Nigeria and Libya, other corners of the world, uh, you can see that uh, this is a, a danger that is hard really to calculate uh, the, the magnitude of and difficult to combat. So, Loretta has developed uh, this, uh, the idea with uh, these uh, two main uh, key figures. Uh, we have, of course, uh, the people who have been behind uh, the attacks. Of course, we have uh, the Ibrahim Caliph, uh, which since uh, two uh, 2014, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who has taken the name uh, of uh, the father-in-law of Muhammad, uh, the very first caliph. Why? Because he wants to reconstruct uh, the Baghdad Caliphate. In her book, Loretta explains that this person was actually held in Kambuka in a detention center, but was really uh, ignored by the Americans. He's only really uh, come to the fore when the nationalist terrorist um, ISIS strategy has exploded, and people have seen that he is the person who has come center stage uh, as the new caliph. With the use of the internet uh, and social media, this person is uh, recruiting, training, preaching terrorism and training people to commit terrorist uh, attacks. Uh, and certainly at the moment uh, we have uh, the powers that have alternated in government. government uh, we found uh, since the toughest times, uh, they have um, really. Um, it's almost like when we had uh, we were co combating at uh, the worst possible time, and uh, when the People's Party and the Socialist Party decided to come to an agreement uh, with uh, a state pact against terrorism. So at this time, we have this anti-terrorist uh, agreement that has been reached by those uh, those parties that will actually uh, make a difference uh, to our criminal justice, uh, because we, we will have better procedural and criminal instruments. So hopefully we should be able to, within our borders uh, and with uh, legislation to help us, uh, we should be able to effectively combat all of these um, activities, uh, training, uh, pr proselytism, indoctrination, the, the strengthening of the Islamic problem from here. So thank you, Loretta, very much. Uh, and thank you for the introduction uh, that I've been able to give for you. Well, you haven't finished, have you, yet? Uh, you'll be able to join us in the debate a little later. But let me give the floor now to Manuel Gomez Acebo so that he can also make an introduction before I give the floor to Loretta. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Thank you. I have to say this first of all, of course. Thank you for asking me to join the panel with um, people of such uh, prestige. I'm overwhelmed. The international terrorism field uh, is one, uh, and the research that is going into it uh, the expertise of my fellow panelists um, here from the prosecution service uh, and as an author, it's wonderful. But uh, what I can do is only give you some insight into the way we see this phenomenon from the foreign ministry in Spain and other international institutions. But first of all, Casa Arabia, I have to say congratulations for the excellent work that is being done. You really are dealing with uh, the key dangerous uh, and interesting issues that fall within your competence, uh, which isn't just the Arab world, it goes beyond that, of course, to Islamic countries in October. There, there was a, a roundtable session, uh, challenges for Spain uh, about uh, radicalism uh, in uh, Syria and Iraq. Uh, we had uh, some already some pointers uh, to the fact uh, that uh, you were really uh, moving into uh, dealing with the activities of the, that the most serious activities. So this book, I think, uh, is a timely one. The event is a timely one. In a coordinated 
manera coordinada, digamos, way. Incluye distintas ideas, distintas a lot of sources have been used, uh, and I think uh, that the general public can be made to see quite clearly the severity of the challenge here, ISIS, the Islamic State, and I'm not going to use that term again and say Islamic State. Why? Because by saying that, we are almost accepting the, its own premises. A lot of non-extremist Arab states, ordinary people, I like to talk about uh, the Daesh, uh, maybe we're not pronouncing this properly, but they, it's the acronym for the Islamic State in Iraq and Al-Sham, which is the Levant or Syria, after taking over Mosul, the organization decided to change its name, uh, forgetting about Syria and Iraq, uh, and started to say it was just the Islamic State and the Caliphate, um, Baghdad even changed its name and took on a new name as if it was putting on new clothes. So if we accept that it is the Islamic State and call it that, it's almost like saying that it will be such. Because a lot of people say that it's actually not a state, it's an anti-state. Colloquially, we were just chatting about this and using those words. It, its ambition is far-reaching. It, it wants to be a state. But it is at the same time reject, rejecting the international order that underpins states in the world today. The Charter, the UN Charter, of course, uh, is another matter. They would, if they accepted the Charter, they would have to accept international order. That is why it has this ambition. It wants to be a state, but it doesn't accept what it means to be a state. It is not a state that we could have an ordinary relationship with. A lot of Arabs say that it's not Islamic either, that what it's doing is using not even a version of Islam, but a perversion of Islam, which is a religion uh, that covers more than 1.5 billion people. And it is not in any way promoting the methods of Islam. But it is, at the same time, extremely ambitious in what it is trying to do, and the methods it uses are very complex. Uh, Daesh is a terrorist group, but it's more than that. It's also a militia. It's an army. It's a criminal organization. It's a group of criminals that are doing everything possible to get resources and funding. At the same time, it is a propaganda machine, and it is a school also, uh, that uh, is running on the basis of a perverse ideology. So it is absolutely new because of uh, the fact that it brings together the combination of factors um, um, and successfully mingling them together. That success, in my view, and it's not just my personal view, I've read a lot of works by people who know more about this than myself, the success is based on the failure of states, the, the, inter, the institutional vacuum that exists. This could, perhaps, the, the reason for this phenomenon of Daesh could be because of the failure of the Arab Spring, there were certainly some common factors there. There were societies that were combating state structures that did not provide them with the social services and the rights that they felt they were entitled to in society. And when there is a vacuum, a gap like that, then this organization, this group, tends to step in and try and fill that gap. It has a jihadist ideology underpinning it, but at the same time, it very cleverly includes um, these national project uh, elements, and we've seen that uh, in uh, the way it is uh, fighting in Iraq. 
Yeah, with uh, its um, alignment with the, the, the sunnies, it has uh, an ideological project, though, that covers uh, the whole universe of believers, not just in Syria and Iraq. Uh, and that is why perhaps it decided not to use uh, Syriac, uh, Syria and Iraq in its uh, name anymore. When it took over Mosul, Mosul then the, the borders, uh, the former borders, uh, of the sykes Pico uh, divide between Syria and Iraq uh, came down. So it has a very versatile, flexible ideology which also embraces uh, a, a multi um, pronged uh, approach. It's got a military approach too. It's trying to really uh, take over more and more territory. We've seen that uh, in in Somalia and and in 2013, in Mali, the jihadist uh, terrorist uh, groups uh, were almost uh, on the verge of reaching Bamako. But they weren't operating in such a multi-pronged uh, approach. Uh, they are also operating as terrorists. Javier said that already. And to achieve their aims, they use them. Um, Dif ethnic differences, um, the idea of uh, sectarian um, approaches and differences too. But I think more than anything else, they've been very clever about the way they use the internet and, and social media to recruit people to their cause. They have been very successful doing so. Uh, also, the military victories have helped them. If you are going to say you're a state uh, and tell people you are, you have to actually uh, show people that you are successful. And if you can successfully take over territory, then uh, you can nurture and feed that strategy of bringing in more recruits uh, and developing more propaganda. They followed also the ideas of a franchise there, that there's a stamp, there's a seal of belonging to the group. This isn't new, is it? Al-Qaeda did this before. In the Islamic Maghreb, uh, as well as um, on the uh, Arab Peninsula, it's the same method that is being uh, followed by the Daesh. We've seen that uh, in, the, in the Sinai province uh, and the three provinces in Libya, Boko Haram is also doing something very similar. Their leader just, uh, I think, uh, yesterday has accepted uh, the authority or impact of the Daesh. So they're combining these elements are uh, taking full advantage uh, of uh, this um, phenomenon uh, that uh, is snowballing forward from Spain and from Europe. Uh, we see this as something that is outside. It's also internal, though. It's here. At, uh, in fact, uh, Javier, you mentioned, I can't remember which newspaper, there was an article today published about the fact uh, that they're recruiting uh, also Spanish nationals, aren't they? As well as other European uh, nationals. That means this is something that we should not just keep at arm's length as an international phenomenon. Dice also is taking full advantage of uh, its assets. Uh, it is taking advantage of uh, different rivalries, uh, the sectarian uh, divide uh, because uh, of, of the uh, Shia and the Sunni worlds uh, and the differences. Uh, it tries to uh, thrust a wedge between them and take full advantage of the divide. Uh, in the Sunni world, there's, there's the political Islamic uh, state idea, those that accept uh, that the po that political Islam has a role to play through the um, Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, and other Arab countries that are completely opposed to that idea. How do they use that? Well, you can see that in Libya. There is no sectarian divide between uh, Shia, Shia, Shiites and um, Sun Sunnis. And you can see that with Al-Qaeda, because 
It's all about uh, being the purest force uh, in this uh, battle, Daesh, uh, more than Al-Qaeda in many areas. All of these elements, I think, uh, are reflected in the book. What I can say is that it is so far-reaching and ambitious and multi-pronged that we have to react internationally in a similar way. We could never possibly react as quickly on the ground as the group can do too, but certainly in the UN there have been resolutions uh, adopted in the Security Council to combat uh, terrorist world. Uh, in August there was one in September about um, foreign terrorist competence uh, joining Daesh. Uh, the UN Secretary General, I believe, is already drawing up a new action plan about violent terrorism. The European Union, I would say, is finalizing now a specific strategy against Daesh. Looking particularly at the underlying conflicts in Iraq and Syria that um, are helping to strengthen it, and then there's the anti dais coalition with a whole multitude, a host of countries, but they also have to take into account uh, the different areas. One is the military. Uh, approach. In military terms, they have to be defeated, of course, uh, in Syria, but that's not enough. We also have to fight uh, terrorism. The foreign combatants uh, put a stop to radicalization is another facet, and the humanitarian consequences of these conflicts. But for me, the biggest challenge is with the fact that an ideology is that has not grown up in Europe has to be really defeated in that part of the world. So it is the Muslim leaders, the Arab countries themselves, that have to be able to come up with an ideological alternative that must first of all ensure that the Daesh discourse uh, is no longer seen as legitimate, but come up with some attractive alternative. And we cannot do that here from Europe, or well, certainly we cannot do that as people living in a culture that is different and foreign to them. I think perhaps I've taken a little too long over my introduction, but I hope that some of these ideas will come up again in the discussion later. Thank you very much, Manuel. Earlier on, I, I forgot to say, uh, uh, before the first panelist spoke and the second, second panelist uh, spoke, uh, that uh, this uh, presentation is being uh, tweeted in, in English and Arabic. There will be a, a recording made in English of this uh, event uh, so that we can have uh, both languages available in Spanish and English. Uh, uh, I just wanted to tell you uh, that. Uh, and we're going to ask um, Loretta to answer some questions. Qu questions that uh, link up to the words uh, of uh, Javier and Manuel. The very first question is uh, what uh, the origins of the dice or the uh, so called Islamic State uh, and the responsibility of the West? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much to Casarabe for organizing this conference. And uh, um, thanks to my old friend Javier, who's uh, always, who always uh, has me present my books. And uh, of course, uh, thanks uh, to um, the uh, director as well and to Manuel. The, the story of this book is related to the origins of the group that we called either Daesh or the uh, or ISIS, I've worked uh, very intensively on uh, uh, how terror and terrorism is financed uh, through um, the Al Zakawi's uh, funding, and 
Now, the, when uh, people uh, believe that this was a phenomenon that dated back to the past and that was already history, I have kept on uh, studying it and uh, doing uh, research in it. And then in uh, 2013, I thought that the, the problems, uh, the issue in, in Syria was uh, going to become extremely serious. I decided to uh, to investigate just, um, the uh, Al Zakawi's uh, original group, um, a radical Salafi group that began uh, uh, its uh, um, terrorist activities at the ends of the at the end of the uh, 60s, and then that group uh, in turn became uh, a new organization that uh, remained in Syria where they looked for the necessary funds to re uh, uh, to be uh, reconstituted as a new and very dangerous terrorist group and then I decided to write this book I went to um, this uh, American publisher in New York and um, I, I told them, well, I, I think that there is something very interesting here that we must write this book. Well, my publisher said, well, I don't think this is going to be such a big deal, but I always publish all of your books. So if you really want to do this, go ahead. We, we will publish it only as an e-book. And it's going to be, you know, you know, a very uh, limited edition because nobody's going to be interested in reading it. That's what I was told. And so that, that's what I did. And, well, it's not a very long book. It's, you know, quite short. But uh, it's now been translated in 20 languages already. And why? And this is the question, uh, you know, I was asking myself now, even now. Why could I see what was going on in Syria and why didn't uh, any intelligence organizations from the US and yeah, Western Europe or other journalists, experts, why didn't they see what was going on? This is about the origins of that group. In uh, 2010, when al-Baghdadi was uh, um, elected as uh, uh, the, the leader, uh, of this group after um, being released from Camp Bukha because the, 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 when the Americans went back to the States, there was nobody who could uh, uh, run Camp Bukha for them or, you know, other camps where, where uh, other jihadists were kept. And that the, the, uh, uh, the decision that al-Baghdadi took at the time, uh, it, it, I think it was a really uh, a brilliant uh, decision that he made. He went uh, to Syria, where they they could get, he could get have access to funds coming from all the Gulf states, uh, from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and other um, um, origins, other sources, and they reconstitute the group whose uh, goal was always creating the caliphate in Iraq. And that was the the group, the, the, origin, the origin of the group. They left, they went to, to Syria because they had a unique opportunity there. But the, the um, goal from the beginning, from its inception, was Iraq. And the, the objective now is to conquer Baghdad. And we, we don't know where they will go from there. But it's uh, quite an interesting story because um, the West actually delegated the, the management, so to speak, uh, um, the, of, of the war um, on the, uh, the Gulf, on the Gulf allies, the, their allies in the Gulf. And they did not do, they did not do it right. And well, it, because the, it was known that um, ISIS, that in uh, 2013 was called the Islamic State of Iraq, and then they became the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham, that means the Levant, uh, 
what the the uh, Americans call ISIL, that, and that they became the strongest group, and they they were not fighting uh, just um, 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 a group by proxy, and they were not uh, uh, warring by proxy, but um, by um, uh, media pressure, sheer media pressure. So all new jihadists wa wanted to join that group, and they they um, they and no other um, groups. And I think that the West can be uh, the West. Uh, the West has made many mistakes. You cannot uh, fight anybody else by proxy and delegate your your role and uh, your wars to anybody else. Um, Europe is. Uh, just on the other side of the Mediterranean, uh, of the Mediterranean, um, that's Or Sea, Mare Nostrum. And uh, I think that we should look at this phenomenon with new eyes. The um, barbarism, the violence that we see in videos, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's just the, the, the image to see at the forefront. But in the background, there is a very long-term programming, uh, long-term planning and scheming, uh, an ideology that is anti-capitalist, uh, that is uh, uh, trying to join together all the jihadist world. And it's going to expand and to become universal. That's what they intend to do. This is the first time we're actually witnessing it, but we will be seeing this again. We have to hit movements in uh, South Asia now. Same phenomenon that we've witnessed, uh, you know, Boko Haram, we can, can happen again with new groups. This is a front that is uh, uh, confronting us, that is opposing us, not only the Western world, but also the modern day Muslim world that wants to be, be and be seen as a modern, pragmatic, and anti-imperialistic front. This is why young people are leaving. They are being seduced, fascinated. Uh, those young people who actually don't know where, you know, they don't fit anywhere. They don't know, um, they don't understand uh, the culture. Uh, the parents' culture, because they come from a different country that they have not known, and they don't feel uh, in, they don't feel um, the Western culture as theirs, and uh, they don't feel they belong there. And then they see this Islamic state, uh, uh, the motherland or the fatherland, the imperialistic experience, and this this is a danger really that's where the danger really lies we are going to be losing all these people they're going to become our enemies and well as i was saying this uh, the military intervention policy doesn't work well and this 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 is why the title of my book is the islamist phoenix because this is a phoenix we're talking about with al zakawi uh, well, that he was the origin uh, of the group, but this has become a much stronger group. It is, it is now a state. Well, at least they claim to be one, and uh, they they act and move like one. Uh, uh, this uh, what happened in Iraq when the intervention in Iraq in 2003 gave rise to this, and now this is going to be a new Islamist phoenix that is going to be even stronger. And in five, ten years, the problem will uh, just be uh, greater. And we need a long-term solution. We, we don't need, and it, has, it must not be a military solution. Uh, must be a political solution, diplomatic solution that um, is the outcome of uh, a general debate uh, between people who actually know what the phenomenon is about, not really this knee-jerk reaction to uh, brutal violence, uh, to videos where brutal violence is portrayed. This is uh, the, the error made by many politicians and many citizens. Um, estamos viendo por 
we're seeing that on, on the one side we have a state and on the other side we have an anti-state uh, uh, position. I think the, the, they're pretty common in position. I think the shell state, uh, don't you uh, talk about it in the book, uh, uh, it's um, Yes, uh, shell state uh, is the right idea. Let's see if we can find a good term for it in Spanish. Uh, yes, uh, shell as in uh, the outer casing. It was... This is a concept that does come up in the book uh, with uh, when we talk about uh, jihadist terrorism and how it's find funded. I think I talk about the embryonic state, don't I? We certainly seeing that there is this attempt to have control over a state and it really has to have three elements Pop population is one territory is another one and then it has to have an organization and as well as sovereignty of course and to be recognized yes but i think the first three uh, points uh, are there aren't they we're seeing that uh, it's a magnet for young people not so young people as well have you mentioned 5000 different western um, westerners have gone out there to uh, enlist uh, with them um, the use of the media uh, very powerful uh, use of the media which uh, takes us into a new reality it's a change or it's a re-emergence uh, uh, of uh, the Islamist uh, phoenix, uh, uh, something different from Al-Qaeda. What way is it different? Well, it is very different to Al-Qaeda, isn't it? Al-Qaeda was an organization that never uh, developed uh, into a state or an embryonic state at all. Let me see if I can explain a little the, the idea of this embryo or embryonic uh, state. You're right that uh, a state uh, does uh, need to, to have those different elements that we just described a moment ago, but the classic uh, idea of a modern state uh, is about a nationalist uh, idea. A group of people get together and decide to build up a state, and that is a political decision that is taken. It's a, a decision um, on the taken on the basis of nationalism. We have a state uh, because we're all Spaniards uh, and Spain is our state and only after that does the typical infrastructure of any state uh, get developed the economic structure the financial structure the organization of foreign defense um, the structures of law and order an embryo state and you go and often get that in terrorist uh, organization in the IRA for instance in Northern Ireland uh, you can see some elements of it, as well as in the Basque country, in some parts of the Basque country, where there is a certain amount of control over part of the population by terrorist groups. So what do those terrorist groups do? They, they are, do not have self-determination. The, the state it does not have that entitlement, but nevertheless, uh, they make sure that people know that they control the territory. The mafia does exactly the same. And in, in exchange for that control over the territory, uh, the, they provide basic um, infrastructure or services to the people, but they, all of those services are controlled by this uh, group, and that is the embryo state, really. It's outside. It's, it's the shell. It's the, um, the outer layer or wrapping of a state, but it doesn't have the, the core of a state. So what the Islamic State is doing now is to, is to create that embryo in the territory it controls, of course, and in that, that territory, what it's trying to do is seek consensus. It wants consensus by the people. It is trying to build up that nationalistic uh, strength. And it's, it, it's unique in that way. The IRA, the IRA didn't do that. It was located and based in a power base when everybody believed in and defended the IRA. But in this case, this is different because these people have been conquered by the Islamic State. The Islamic State 
gets to the territory, it wins over the territory, but it says and to the people living there, we are better than the government there, we are a better state. And at the end of the day, the people in that territory that has been taken over it actually chooses the Islamic State because it's better, they think it's a better option than Assad or the dictator they had before, whatever regime that was in, in power, al balik in, in Iraq. And that, that is that is the ingenious way that they act, and that is the great danger in the Islamic State. So the difference between the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda is huge. Osama bin Laden never had such a modern view of the state. Bin Laden was also fighting against the far-off enemy, a remote enemy, the United States. Then bin Laden's strategy was to launch spectacular attacks on that country. And most of the jihadists al Zarqawi, for instance, didn't want to go off and fight against the enemy that was far away. The jihadist um, rhetoric was always about fighting against the enemy at home. The regimes, uh, the the Muslim uh, uh, regimes that they felt were corrupt or were oligarchies, uh, so there was a key difference between them. The people in the Middle East find it easier to to group around uh, the idea of Islamic State than, than to get behind bin Laden. And I think people find it very hard to, to understand that. That when the United States has to understand when it's thinking about changing how to change regimes in the Middle East. The Islamic State and the people in it are much closer to the people in the Middle East. And I think the Arab Spring was absolutely fundamental in all of this because the Arab Spring told us that most of the people living in the Middle East actually wanted change. They wanted a regime change. They did not want to continue under the governments and regimes that they had up, up until then. And they wanted to make a democratic change with the Arab Spring, but it was a failure. The only country with a positive outcome of the Arab Spring is Tunisia, which is the country with uh, the perhaps most advanced education system and people are more educated. It's a very different country here. Egypt and, and Syria, well, Syria, it was civil war, wasn't it, the outcome of the Arab Spring? So the position of the Islamic State, if we look at uh, it in relation to the Arab Spring, well, it's a danger again, isn't it? Why? Because when you have young Muslims uh, that are tempted by radicalization and, and the Middle East, if we compare the two, of course, you get incitement to violence. We have to think about that. And it's not the Al-Qaeda-style violence now, is it? It's not uh, these attacks that are launched against the Twin Towers in New York. We're talking now about patriotic violence because there is an ideological or, or an idea here, you said, this is our state, uh, come and help us, we need you, come and join our ranks, we need women too, they're saying to people, because without women, they will never be able to produce the future generations of the state. Al-Qaeda's message was completely negative, come and join us and you will die, you will um, go off there and you will uh, commit uh, suicide attacks there. Uh, you will be a suicide bomber. This is different. This is saying, come to us, come to the state, and you will have a family and you will have a real life with us. So the realities that are being put forward by the two 
worlds, the two groups are, are very different. The Islamic State its message is a very seductive one. Before we move on to Q&A and give the chance to people in the audience to ask uh, questions, let's talk about Boko, Boko Haram, which is uh, a franchise uh, over there. It's been said that it is a vassal of the Islamic State. Is that true? Well, this is um, a very interesting question. I think that the um, uh, great success that um, the Islamic State has had and still has, and um, uh, you know the attention of the press as well, is uh, a key element for organizations such as Boko Haram, who intend to develop and grow among other stronger organizations. It is true that Boko Haram is the strongest group in Africa, but they don't have the mediatic or the media profile that uh, uh, the Islamic State has, because the Islamic State controls uh, territory and uh, presents, such as, uh, like we said, um, and a political alternative that is quite uh, strong, that is very appealing uh, to young people and uh, uh, and very useful for recruiting. Whether whether and whereas um, the Boko Haram does not have any of this, and so they want to capitalize on on uh, our perception of the Islamic State and on that name, but I don't think that's uh, quite the same thing. We will see what happens, but. I think that um, um, they don't uh, have the structure, um, uh, the Lib and the Libyans don't have the structures or the vision that uh, Baghdadi uh, has had. They cannot uh, actually create, will not be able to create this shell uh, um, uh, state that um, Abu Ghadi has created in Iraq, and same thing goes for Boko Haram. But that's not, uh, you know, what's really what's actually important to them. For them, uh, it's how they are seen, how they are perceived, the propaganda effect um, for for recruitment, um, how the potential uh, recruit. Uh, can 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 see that message um, for uh, that Boko Haram is now has now pledged allegiance to to um, uh, the is the Islamic State. At any rate, nobody knows where reality lies. Everything is is is, is about the image. Uh, it's about uh, sort of a mental conditioning. Uh, of course, uh, I think they know uh, very well about uh, uh, communication sciences. Uh, they know about psychology and human psychology and who can be the best victims uh, of those and who well of course we are but um, young Muslims uh, most of most of all in this case let me see if I can uh, and ask you a question see if we can some, prompt some discussion um, Syria and Iraq we know really what's going on out there we know about the dimensions then and the magnitude of what's happening there you're saying that uh, military strategy might not actually work uh, I mean are, are we just trying to uh, uh, keep uh, uh, curb what's happening then or, or should we really be looking at uh, the Daesh and uh, in its own territories do you have some idea about what we could do and uh, what sort of strategy is it just containment you might you might say that we're actually um, uh, living uh, through the consequence of what happened in 2003, the the invasion of Iraq, uh, and uh, really, basically, the we're seeing that uh, we're reaping uh, the uh, results of what happens. Uh, we've been seeing that we've got uh, occupied Syria, we've got uh, the Iraqi ter territory that's been now divided up by government. It's actually pretty structured in the way that they're, they're working. They really are drawing it up a, a real, a veritable state, although we might not like to see that. They've got territory, they've got an army, they've got a energy resources, they've got power structures, and they're starting to to weave a social economic uh, fabric there. Uh, they 
may not go much further than that. But um, Libya is another worry, not just Iraq and Syria, because the, the presence of the, the Daesh, the Islamic State there, it, it's a faction there which has uh, started to, to operate in a similar way. Libya it's not Iraq, it's not Syria. Uh, of course, one of the uh, disadvantages is the proximity to Israel, so you might uh, find uh, the whole uh, scale uh, the unimaginable consequences. But uh, it's very close to Tunisia, of course, uh, and uh, Algeria and Morocco, of course. Just imagine if the faction of the Islamic State, which is at the moment located in Libya, dis takes over the Libyan territory and then does exactly the same expanding onwards, things would change uh, totally for us, for Mediterranean countries, Spain and Italy in particular, although the Italians uh, seem to uh, uh, almost joke about things like this. I read uh, an article the other day uh, explaining in Twitter, tweet, tweet messages, uh, they, the, the messages, they were talking about Islamic State, they were saying, uh, hurry up, hurry up, uh, come and occupy Italy, they were saying in their tweets, uh, because our Italian politicians are really ruining everything. So they were joking a little uh, about it and uh, being very uh, ironic uh, about uh, the Islamic State's uh, territory again. But what about Libya, though? Would we get a situation similar ever to what's happened in Iraq and Syria? It's much more tribal, isn't it, in Libya? Would the Islamic State need the collaboration of the, of the tribal elements for this to work? I think that Libya is a failed state. Libya is not Iraq or Syria. We have 1,700 different armed groups in Libya. Certainly, that was the figure a couple of weeks ago. So it is a country that is highly fragmented. The success of the Islamic State is also very much linked to the presence of people peoples who are tribal, but there are some similarities there within the, the Sunni groups. The, the border between Syria and Iraq was a, a, a border that's always divided peoples and tribes that in the past always worked together. That is why the the symbolic nature of that border uh, is so important. Uh, Libya isn't like that. The tribes are very independent, they're very regional uh, in their power base. Libya is a nation created by the uh, the, by Italy, by the, the colonizing power. It didn't exist before that. And then it became a state that was uh, upheld and maintained by uh, Gaddafi, by a dictator, for, for a long time. It doesn't have the history uh, of Iraq and uh, Syria, the Sunnis. Uh, so I don't think uh, this, it, it's a model that can work uh, as it did in Syria, but it could be exported to Tunisia, to Algeria, and to Egypt, because in those countries, uh, the conditions are ripe for replication of the Islamic State, and maybe what will happen in Libya is that there will be uh, this um, knock-on effect from Libya to the close countries. Uh, that's the danger. The, the presence of the Islamic State and jihadist groups uh, in a country where there is a total anarchy in, in the Mediterranean, well, there's a danger there. We've got what about the, the Somalian pirates? What, maybe, maybe we'd end up um, with those uh, Libyan pirates. That is the next level. That would be the escalation. 
What about all of this uh, smuggling that's going on between Africa and Italy? But what about piracy? Maybe they would turn to piracy the way the Hadith groups are, are doing in Somalia. What would you do to do then? Tres comentarios rápidos. Ya of uh, short comments related to what you just said. I just read a couple of days ago that um, a boat that had been um, intercepted with uh, 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 illegal immigrants and uh, the um, actually the the, the people uh, were actually demanded uh, the immigrants to, to return the, the boat to them. And there have been uh, several piracy um, actions uh, in that area. Uh, it would be uh, quite dangerous if it became international in international waters. We have been discussing the uh, Islamic State, but in the case of Libya, it's not uh, um, just a, a crisis uh, in uh, a terrorism crisis in Libya, Syria. Iraq. It's it's a political crisis, and in Syria, people felt uh, excluded, so people felt uh, discriminated against, and this was the perfect um, um, place for for this uh, all this uh, um, insatisfaction on these complaints grow and become uh, what they have become, and this is but this is a political. Issue. This is a political conflict. Same thing goes for Libya, uh, and it cannot be solved uh, through military intervention. Uh, uh, there is an absence of a state. Gaddafi was the the key there um, to to distribute um, uh, perks and advantages, and uh, but he never uh, actually never allowed for for the creation of a true uh, state. So once he is gone, there's nothing uh, left. Uh, there are many tribes, many different uh, local and regional interests. Um, so uh, some conflicts, ideological conflicts as well between moderates and those who are not. But mostly, the the crisis there is due to 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 lack of a national understanding. So this has created a vacuum, and um, so uh, other groups have um, emulated what's most effective now. And uh, what is most effective now in the international arena? Well, Daesh, the, the Daesh brand, so to say, so to speak. And, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq, this, uh, uh, they're trying to include more, other, uh, have more inclusive uh, policies, including the Sunnis, including the Kurds. That's uh, what's happening in Iraq. Uh, because many of the borders are quite artificial. It were, they were artificially imposed, as in many other parts of the world. But to recreate and redraw these uh, borders according to um, more uh, uh, tribal-based uh, reasons or regional-based region, uh, reasons will not necessarily mean that uh, uh, things are going to get better. Uh, but the Islamic State wants to become a state, wants to have a, a military strategy and have um, have military conquests. Others say that they would uh, need to respond to that. We would, need, we would need to respond to that with a military action. But what's most important is the war on ideas. You can conquer in a territory, uh, but if you enter uh, Mosul, which is a sunny area with uh, Kurds and with uh, uh, Shia, you will not win over the whole population. You will need to include all the of those all those people who are risking their own future there, their, all their lives. Um, but so I. I in, in Baghdad, you have a, a, a legitimate government, and who requested the the aid of the international community. So this is why there was not necessary to have a resolution by the UN. And uh, well, they had an overwhelming support, 
uh, here in, in, in we had an, the, the Spanish government had an overwhelming support uh, when uh, um, by all of the different political parties to send um, um, to send uh, troops to Syria. There's uh, the legitimacy and up uh, to Iraq rather and um, to uh, in Syria the things are quite different. The, the, this is uh, so. Um, this is a uh, you know what's happening and what's going on in the UN forum. Well, I'd like to uh, uh, refer to to these uh, last couple of interventions uh, uh, to refer to a couple of uh, issues that are now becoming a hot topic of conversation. Rome, not the Vatican City, not. Uh, uh, capital of Italy, but as the uh, cradle of civilization, uh, everybody uh, was uh, uh, came from Rome. Uh, the um, uh, the Rome uh, Romanians, uh, the Roma, everything comes uh, from uh, from there. The uh, that empire, the uh, called the young people to uh, the appeal uh, of the empire. So remind, uh, remembering Rome is quite important there. So this, the, the, this call to this 21 cops and uh, was, was so essential. They will not, they don't know whether they will be able to get there due to the, uh, and this, this appeal for, for um, you know, for the uh, Islamic State, uh, to to conquer Rome quickly, um, uh, otherwise there will be nothing left. It's quite funny. Well, that that is if they can uh, go through traffic and make it on time. Um, in 1911, Libya was created, uh, but you have to remember that uh, the First World War did not begin in 1914 and lasted until 1918, but it actually began in 1911. Uh, the uh, Europe was uh, uh, ill, and it didn't, uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, that situation didn't actually finish until 1923. Ember, uh, one of the uh, fighters in the Ottoman Empire, was He died when he tried to convey this first uh, jihadism to call on the rebellion of Muslims, and that he had also played a very important role in the uh, uh, period between the two great wars. So Syria is already at the origin of one of the um, um, uh, of the great wars, same as Libya. And there's a third element. I, I was trying not to mention it, but you know, I, uh, it must come out. That's uh, how the borders were drawn. Sykes Picot is uh, is always uh, um, mentioned as the origin. Well, it's not actually. It is the symbol of an old tradition. Um, some developments that began in 1915 in the negotiations of Mark Mahon with uh, Hussein, then uh, uh, continued with Sykes Picot, and then it uh, um, went to the Balfour Declaration, who in turn gave rise to the Israel. Palestinian borders and so on and so forth. And only in 1946, 1948, or 1967, depends on how you look at it, you can take a look. Uh, you you can you you had the uh, borders such as they are drawn today. This might you know seem anecdotal, but let me let me explain. You have to remember that in Sykes Picot, you. In the lower part of Anatolia, there, there were the there was the the Italians who no longer were there. Then the Russians had to to ride to the Bosphorus and to Istanbul, and they had to um, get to Armenia that didn't exist either. Palestine, 
Palestine and Israel was going to be a different area until that was uh, the case until uh, 1956. And Mosul was part of Syria, not part of Iraq. That's important. It was only in Paris when Clemenceau accepted the possibility that it uh, became part of Iraq. So that's a historical anecdote, but it's quite important uh, and to the point in this case. If we accept the uh, Daesh narrative, well, first, we, we are already doing so. I mean, we are already accepting it. I mean, it might be just for an anecdote, but that is also uh, an acceptance. But there is a second element which is quite major. If we accept that two middle-level uh, civil servants, one French man and one English man, one who was an incompetent who left and forgot uh, the list of the nationalist leaders who uh, he had been discussing with. He left it and forgot it in the safe of his uh, embassy uh, before he left. And then when um, uh, the Ottoman authorities and our troops uh, arrived, uh, got and grabbed that list when he left, well, they uh, um, killed everybody on that list, and so on and so forth. So if we accept that for 100 years and beyond, these two middle-level civil servants uh, determine the future of the uh, Middle East, well, then you open the gates to anything, uh, and you open uh, to put into question any of the international decisions that have been made after that. So, And so it, it just tells you that behind that the error that the um, uh, invasion of Iraq was, there is a greater error that was the creation of the, of the borders of present-day Iraq. So um, if we put that into question, we put into question many different decisions. So if we actually take them, uh, take the, the word for it, uh, the, uh, you blame everything on sykes picot then you are opening the door to all that. And uh, of course, there's also the link uh, to the, colo uh, the colonialism, uh, to colonialism, the uh, um, the uh, and apparently Sh uh, the Shia population is to be uh, um, eliminated because they are external to the territory, and that's also very dangerous. Contrary to what Manuel said, I think that we should try and win over that battle, uh, even if it's only over an anecdote. And on that point, your book is actually very good, because it leaves that uh, front, that door open, uh, open to the discussion of the different ideas. That's what we all we are all here for. So I'll just now pass on the floor to you, and uh, it's time for Q&A. Whenever a book is being presented, it's always uh, uh, good for people to talk about the book. And we have talked about the book all the time. It's a very good book. I recommend you go out and buy it. Thank you very much.